But if there is a favorite to finish in the top two, it would be 27-year-old Josh Davis, triple gold medalist from the 96 Olympics. Most golds, Rowdy, by any American man at those games. You know, I have seen Josh Davis take a lot of races out very fast, but I've never seen Josh take it out that fast. And he's still ahead of world record pace of the half. Davis looks like he's going to win it. And Davis sets an American record. He breaks a 12-year-old mark. What a swim for Davis. Welcome to the Ultimate Swimmer Podcast. I'm your host, three-time Olympic gold medalist and captain of the 2000 USA team, Josh Davis. Here at Ultimate Swimmer, we hope to inform, inspire, and encourage you to be the very best version of you, physically, mentally, and spiritually, on your swimming journey. This podcast is geared primarily for those of us in the aquatic disciplines of age group swimming, college swimming, para swimming, open water swimming, and master swimming. But we welcome all who are interested in peak performance, pursuing excellence, and swimming with purpose. So whether you are just starting out in the pool or you've been swimming your entire life, you were born for the water and you were also born for greatness. So each week we will explore the seven core habits of achieving greatness that will help take you to the next level in your journey to becoming an ultimate swimmer. This episode is brought to you by Breakout Swim Clinics, the longest running swim clinic tour of swimming Olympians in U.S. history. Breakout Swim Clinics has been providing swim clubs with the biggest Olympic names for the best prices with gold medal service since 1997. Go to BreakoutSwimClinic.com and bring some of their great Olympians to your team to help your swimmers break out. Bigger names, better prices, gold medal service. Break out with the best. BreakoutSwimClinic.com Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Ultimate Swimmer podcast. I'm your host, Josh Davis, and I'm super excited to have with me this week. He needs no introduction. You just see the GMM and you know who I'm talking about. It's gold medal Mel. There he is. But let me introduce you, Mel. Let me, I got a good resume here for you. You were high school national champion, NC2A champion, world champion, two-time Olympian and Olympic gold medalist, a movie script writer, co-founder of the most popular swimming website on the planet, along with your beautiful wife and talented Tiffany, and an ambassador of the USA Swimming Foundation and alumni, a pioneer of the side breathing and one of the best butterflyers in the history of the world, and most importantly, a friend and hero of mine. Welcome to the show, a true ultimate swimmer, Mel Stewart. To know Josh Davis is to love Josh Davis. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. This is... Uh, a little overdue because I, I usually in the past we would connect about once or twice a month and rap. It's been gosh six seven months now, but uh, I just we love. Oh, we haven't talked in that long. I mean, for like a minute maybe. It's, we, I've never gone that long without talking to you. <laughs> yeah, it's been. We're always, always talking. We're talking about something. There's always something happening. Well, no, I take that back. We got to connect at trials a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that we was. Saw, that was there were hugs at trials. There were high fives at trials. And if anybody understands the, the Josh Davis, uh, you know, energy, you know, being with you at trials, like riding shotgun, it's like, you know, that my two favorite people to like be at a meet with and sit next to Josh Davis, and probably Brent Rudemiller, because Brent Rudemiller is like, a, he's a teacher and a historian. And with you, you're like the ultimate commentator. It's like it's it's just like I get to get the network commentating plus the cheers. It's, it's kind of special. I'm just I'm just waiting till Rowdy and Elizabeth retire, and then I can I have my shot. But but no, I like to put on a good show. I get excited about swimming, and uh, you were one of the first guys that I got to know on the national team. I remember reading about you in the '80s in my Swimming World magazine. You were just a few years ahead of me, throwing down great times in the fly, and I am in free coming out of Mercersburg Academy, this story prep school. But, um, but before we get into Mercersburg and Tennessee stories, tell me about your childhood growing up. I know there's the PTL thing, but what was your first interaction with swimming and how you fell in love with it? My sister was a swimmer. Uh, uh, you know, uh, swimming trivia. She swam until she was 14. I was 12. I never beat her. I never beat my sister. So she was good, too. She was a sprinter, and uh, and it was pretty clear that I was going to be I was going to move in the direction of mid distance, 
um, look at me, I'm already making excuses for why I didn't beat her. Because I just can't get out of the way of my own ego. <laughs> so if you can't, I'm, I'm a little bit annoyed that I never beat my sister, but she was an extraordinary talent. And, uh, you know, like many young women who swam, it was a huge, it was a lot for her to do. There was a lot going on in her life, and she did quit at 14. But uh, so she learned to swim, and I learned to swim at the same time at the YMCA in Gastonia, North Carolina. I was taught to swim by Charlotte Whiteside. And uh, she, my sister took to the water really well, and I I was one of those kids who you had to like pry the fingers off of the, off of the, you know, the rail. I was scared to death. So that, that's, that's, that's the genesis. Well, I love that, that you weren't super comfortable with it. Supernatural, even beat by your sibling, a sister even. So that's okay. That's okay. It doesn't matter where you start. It's how you finish. And all of us, some of us had rough starts. What was the, what was the transition to year round swimming and club swimming for you? When did it kind of get real? So she started swimming year round and she was seven and I was five. So I was swimming year round at five. Oh, wow. So by the time I was eight, I was swimming uh, at Duke University and North Carolina State Championships. And uh, I think that I won 10 and unders when I was eight. So I was really fast early on. That might be wrong. Uh, I don't remember losing very much when I was little. Right. Uh, I was so I was one of these kids where like, when I was 10, I was in Swimming World Magazine for having the most age group top 16 rankings. And, and I just never lost. And there was a point when uh, I turned 11 and went to 11, 12, and all the swimmers started to get taller. And I was still little Melvin. And I was little Melvin. My dad was big Melvin. And I lost. And like the, one of the first times I lost, I cried. Like I cried. And I think that I was at Duke University. And my father was just beside himself. It's like, you know, the whole sportsmanship conversation was, you know, he, he leaned pretty heavily on me. But yeah, but I went through a transition from, you know, 11 to 13, 14, where uh, I, I, I needed to catch up. I, need, I wow. needed to grow. So I, I, there was some uncomfortable time in there. But, but, but uh, success was early on. Uh, my my theory is that maybe that that season of winning kind of got in your blood, though, and in your system. Like I can do this. I'm good at this. I want more of this. And then there was a season of getting not winning all the time, but it was still locked in there. This competitive juice. The, the only thing that what, you know what it reinforced was this. Um, I was ashamed when I cried. And when I lost and, and but then I started to lose quite a bit. And uh, so I gravitated toward fly because it was the one stroke where I could win. And I realized that the longer I went and butterfly, the, the better my chances were. So early, early on, I started gravitating toward 200 fly. So I was 200 fly mile 400. I am early. I'm Tom Jager school, right? You know, Jager's first event, like his first event was a mile. Right. But, uh, I, had a, I had a hard, I had a tough coach, Frankie Bell, out of North Carolina, Johnston Memorial Y. And she she learned, and she was a, she was a she was a rigid student of Doc Councilman. So I was doing the Doc Count in the 1970s when I was. This is the 1970s. I was doing the Doc Councilman training and dry land and everything else. So I was doing what Spitz was doing and Gary Hall Senior was doing. So I, I was so, you know, you think about our sport and we think about success and talents, extremely important, but, uh, you know, luck matters. And I, and I was very, very lucky to have, like Ian Crocker, you know, like uh, so many swimmers that we know, you, you, you dig into their past, you find out they had an extraordinary age group coach. And I did. Yeah. No, and, and they made putting in the yards somewhat fun, somewhat interesting to keep you showing up, but you put in the yards, you put in the time, and that creates a foundation where you're pretty tough to do some things and to keep going, to have enough success to keep you going. What was the transition from Frankie to Mercersburg? The, um, so I went from, uh, so her assistant coach was a guy named Bruce Stein, and Bruce Stein swam at NC State, and NC State had a very NC State is, is a very is a big powerhouse now, but they weren't for, for a very long time. But in the 1970s, they were. 
Steve Gregg is a silver medalist in the 200 butterfly from 1976. They had, they had a lot of great swimmers in the seventies. So Bruce Stein was in that environment and uh, he understood uh, elite swimming and Frankie left and went to Raleigh. I was in Charlotte. He stayed there and he coached me. And that's where I learned to, I did, I learned not to fear butterfly because I started doing long, I started doing repeat butterfly sets all the time. Yeah. A lot of 200 flies, 400 flies. And, uh, and he was tough. So, I mean, in my phone, he's called my best coach. Like it doesn't come up as his name. It's just my best coach. And in the notes, it's the man who taught me not to fear butterfly. Yeah. Kind of sacred thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, in, in, so in the midst of all this, I can go into the, the history of my, my, when I was younger, my parents lived in Gastonia, North Carolina. And, uh, we, they were, they're evangelical Christians and they were, they're strong faith. I was raised reading seven chapters from the Bible aloud a day at the kitchen table. But, uh, 40 minutes over in Charlotte was the PTO club. That's Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. There's going to be a movie released about them very soon in That's theaters. Right. And, uh, so my parents went to see the show, put the resumes in. My dad became a, a guy Friday manservant for Baker. My mom was a nanny to Tammy Sue, Jamie Charles, her son wasn't born yet. And our lives really hovered around them. Mm-hmm. And that was a, a, you know, it was a child. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. And I really, you know, I loved Jim and I loved Tammy and I loved the family. The uh, first girl I ever kissed playing spin the bottle was Tammy Sue Baker, his daughter. Um, the, you know, just kid stuff. But, uh, by the time I was 15, 16, it was clear that, that so PTO became Heritage USA, became a Christian city. We moved to live in the city. And, um, and it wasn't, a, it, let's just say it was a complicated story, and it was more about money than it was about faith. Yeah. And, uh, and the FBI and the, you know, the Attorney General's office investigated. So things started to really go into a downward spiral. spiral and my parents got together and they knew that I needed to find a stable place. So Mercersburg Academy was boarding school and it was stable and they had a great history of swimmers. And that's how I made my way to a boarding school in Pennsylvania. That's fascinating. One of my swimming world magazines that I'll never forget is you on the cover on the campus of Mercersburg and it's a cool shot. And you were, I don't know, going into your junior, senior year. So you had made a name for yourself in the high school ranks in the mythical national championships every year. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. What are your other epic moments and things you take away from time at Mercersburg? So when I, did, so when I was shut up at Mercersburg, I think it was 1985, 86. And uh, I don't, kids, older people might remember this, but it's like I wore DJ clothes and Chess King clothes. I don't know if you know what those stores are. So I wore zoot suits, huge baggy pants, neon reflective shirts, skinny ties. Uh, and uh, and you, were I, right, I went, you were right out of the Brat Pack movies. I look like I look if you if you just just Google Duran Duran and I modeled my look after Simon Le bon. yes. and and like literally like that was that was by design which is kind of embarrassing but and I met him years later which is cool the uh, but I went to Mercersburg and I stepped out on the campus and it's it's mo- it's the same campus as the Princeton campus it's gorgeous and it was just like a sea of guys with clean cut hair navy blazers khakis and duck boots. So I was, I did not fit in. It was bad. Uh, I had a mullet. So I had, I had short hair and I had hair in the back, my back, you know, it was cut over my ears. And it was like down to here in the back. It was stupid looking. So I, for about six months, I tried to hang on to my identity. And then I eventually assimilated into the prep school, preppy world. And, and, and really became a student there. This, you know, I, I learned how to be a student. And, I, and I'll tell you this, I credit, I spent more time behind a desk than I did in the pool. And uh, I was very insecure about my academic performance. And I became a student at Mercersburg. And I had some, some balance in life. And year over year, I just got better and better. And uh, 
that so the school, the stability of that school and my academic performance, everything kind of gelled there. And uh, so it was in the cover of um, Swimming World. And uh, that was my first cover. And that was very meaningful. I, I don't know about you, but I have, I got a lot of Swimming World magazines in my garage, you know, like that, that was my cultural was identity. It? As yeah. you know, if you're of a certain age, that that's it. But uh, that was, that sweater was a white sweater. We pinned an M on the sweaters to make it look like a Letterman sweater. It's just fully fake. And that's me in front of the chapel, the Mercer's yeah. Chapel, which is a gorgeous chapel. But uh, that was the first time. It, it, the beauty of, of, of a school like Mercer'sburg was that it was a, you know, I, I was, you know, you're going for records, you're trying to be great individually, but the team competition really mattered. So I really got that collegiate experience starting at the age of 15, 16. Yeah. And um, that's the beauty of Mercer'sburg and dual meets. And uh, yeah. So I'll give you a pivotal moment. Pivotal moment was uh, I made it through the first year of school and uh, they didn't know if I'd make it academically. And at that school, 60 was passing and 59 was failing. And I think my average for the year was 61. And I remember that last it was tri trimesters, that last trimester, my advisor went, I walked into the room, I was nervous because I could have gotten kicked out for academic, you know, underperforming. And he jumped up and went, you did it. And, uh, it was like, you got a 61 and, uh, and, uh, the, the, the Val Victorian was in before me. And I think he had like a, like a 91 GPA and he got chewed out for his 91 <laughs> because apparently like it had gone down, but so I, I made it and that was that pivotal moment. And it seemed like at the end of that year, um, I went and won national championship short course and it's uh, and then through that summer, was just felt like I was transformed. So by the time I hit campus the next year, I, I, I had I had my arms around that experience. And I think that's important. That's something that everybody goes through in college. And I went through that early, that moment where it's like, okay, I figured out how to do this. I know how to be a student. I know how to manage my social life, my athletic life, my academic life, and my priorities were in line. So uh, I, I got that all at Mercersburg. I wouldn't I be it. an Olympic. I wouldn't be an Olympic champion if I hadn't gone there. Give us a perspective, uh, context. What was your best short course, two hundred fly, hundred fly time, five hundred free time back then? I thought it was a four twenty five in the five hundred, if I remember correctly. But maybe it was faster wow. than that. Well, I'm old. Do you remember what, what was, your senior year was? Eighty nine. What was your senior year? My senior year was 89. So, the, so this is what I did in high school. In high school, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. My bet. So I was I was the national champion, and I was a prep school national champion in 100 back, and that was a 50 point, 50 point low. I was a 4808 yard butterfly in high school, and I was uh, and I went 144 my junior year in high school. And my senior, that 200 butterfly, and my senior year was, I didn't swim 200 yard fly. I, I did, did it in season and went like a 145. And it was, uh, there was no one around me. It was like a time trial. And then I went to, our Olympic trials were in February in 88. So, because I, I didn't graduate 89, I graduated 88. So, right. so, yeah, so, F, so I was, I was a 157. Point, I was 157.8 at U.S. Olympic Trials in 1988. And that made that was top, was that one or two? Was that, was, wait a second, I'm thinking. Were you first or second that. place at Trials in 88? No, tri no, Trials was, hang on a second, now, wow, this is terrible. I should know this, but you know, this is three decades ago, over three decades ago. No. I was, no, at Nationals, I was a 157.8, and I went up to Trials, I was like a, I think it was like a 158 low. But, um, so I was like, you know, in meters, I was a 157.8 my senior year. And I did, so I didn't get to swim at yards, and I wanted to. I, I felt like I could go a 142 or 143. That was very important. Yeah, and that's, that's still very good. So you get um, – you make the 88 team, and uh, – but at the same time, you, you commit to Tennessee. So give us, a, give us a quick synopsis of why you picked Tennessee and what was it like at trials making the team all kind of, it all happened the same year and a half about, right? Yeah, it was, um, 
Uh, so I can preface it by saying this. I'm talking to you from Austin, Texas. And uh, in, in high school, I took recruiting trips everywhere. And I took it to the University of Texas. My age group coach was really close friends with Eddie Reese. And I, and I knew Eddie because Eddie's just a charming guy who gets, you know, you know who Eddie Reese is. Because Texas was a powerhouse by the time, you know, by the mid to late 80s. And uh, my coach at boarding school was John Trimbley. John Trimbley was the head coach. He took the head coaching position. So my senior year to my freshman year in college, he would, you know, he would be the coach at the University of Tennessee. And he took a bunch of us with him. And it, there was a lot of, there was a lot of pressure to go to the University of Tennessee. And it's like, I wasn't going to go there. I was going to go to Texas. I, it was a hot minute. I was going to go to Cal because I was a Matt Biondi fan. Yep, me too. I really wanted to go to Matt I really wanted to go to mm -hmm. Cal. Cal was, was kind of a, another planet culturally. Mm -hmm. But Texas sort of felt like a comfortable sock. Uh, I really liked it. Um, at Mercersburg, uh, Olympic silver medalist Betsy Mitchell went to Mercersburg. She went to, she went to Texas. Oh, that's she, was right. like a, she was like a mama bear to me. Yeah. So, so I think in another... In an alternate universe, I might have gone to Texas, but I eventually came back and made my home here. I've been, I've been, I've lived here almost eleven years. But uh, so anyway, that's why I went to Tennessee because my head coach at Mercersburg went to the University of Tennessee, and uh, and the the final conclusion of that thought was, there's no variables, there's no blank spaces. I know what I'm going to get, and I felt confident that I would have. I felt like I, I felt like I knew that I could improve under John Trimbley, the head coach. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, we, the, that equation was working. That's cool. That's what I figured because John JT, as we call him, he mm -hmm. recruited me and mm -hmm. my senior year in 90. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a wonderful recruiting trip. Um, just really loved campus, loved the guys. Um, just a great fun time. And then I, then I went to Berkeley and I had a good time at Berkeley and then, then I went to Stanford and I had a really good time at Stanford. And then I went to Texas and I'm like, okay, this is, I think this is where I'm supposed to be. And, uh, but yeah, I'm always curious about people's journeys of, uh, on their recruiting visits. Um, a little side story in 1988, our coach came up to us in March, end of March after the state championships across most championships. And so in the swimming world, it said the national public school record was 302.61 by Mercersburg. And he said, next March in 1989, we're going to break that record. And I said, geez, coach, that's 12 months away. You know, but he's like, Is he, if each of you drop a second in the 400 free, because we were like 306, if each of you drop a second, you can get that record but it's going to take 12 months of preparation for each of you to drop a second. And so we use that goal time 30261. I had it on my mirror, I had it on my notebook, I had it in my bedroom, on my nightstand. I had 30261 everywhere. And for the next 12 months the four of us worked our tails off. And sure enough, we broke it the next March 30241. We broke it by 2 tenths. You broke our record. And it stood for 19 years. Oh my God, until, are you kidding me? Until, until some guys from New Trier, Chicago wore two bodysuits and broke it. It stood for almost 20 years. I didn't know that. That's a great metric. I like that a lot. It makes me bitter that you took it from us because it, it makes me think that if you guys hadn't done that, we would have had that record. Yeah. And even better, we were a public school taking down your private school record. That's, 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 even, that's actually more impressive. It's even better. We were all J J JT recruited to Mercersburg. Like he, he, he sought out talent. Yeah. He, he no. stacked that team. We were, we were a dominant team. It was, yeah. it, was, it was, he created a great atmosphere. He did. I, I always enjoyed my time with him and he was always super encouraging to me. Even after I, you know, didn't pick Tennessee, he always said hi to me. A lot of, a lot of coaches didn't do that when you went somewhere else. But um so 88 trials, 88 Olympics, um, a lot of ups and downs. Seoul wasn't our best showing, but we had Matt Biondi and Janet and Jager doing their thing, which was pretty epic in many ways. But um, give us some highlights, lowlights, what, what, you, what you can share in a, a, a public forum. <laughs> I remember being, what, what, are you, what are you alluding to? 
I, I don't know. That that era to me was all my heroes. And I know the 80s was a little crazy that they you guys got away with stuff that we can't really get away with now. But maybe I'm, I, maybe I'm wrong. What, what's the demographic of the people who listen to this con, this this podcast? I don't know. How old are, they? are they kids? I, or yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know, the kids that go to my clinics and the people that have subscribed or heard about us. Yeah, we're gonna, so keep, we're gonna keep we're gonna keep a G. So there, there's a thing called the code, and you have to follow the code when you represent Team USA because you're mm-hmm. representing your country. Right. And uh, there was a, there. So as legend goes, there was no code until 1987, and then there was a trip to. The Pan Pacific Games, it wasn't Pan Pacific Championships, it was the Pan Pacific Games, which was the first of the Pan Pacific, you know, events in history. And where most people wanted to go to the Pan American Games, but we went to the Pan Pacific Games. Now it's Pan Pacific Championships. Yeah. No one was in the stands. And, uh, but it was a, we went there and, uh, and things got a little crazy. There was a week afterwards in Sydney. So the competition ended, and then as a national team, we spent a week in Sydney. And swimmers, after they finish their big event, and then they have a week to do nothing, is dangerous. <laughs> At the end of a taper and a big meet, that should not that should not happen. And uh, the code was enacted after that. <laughs> I'll leave it there. I'll leave yeah. it there. I'm going to leave it right there. Let me tell you about – I'll tell you about 88. So 88 um, – I think I overtrained in '88, mm-hmm. and uh, but that really wasn't the problem for me. It was I. I, I think that I'm, I'm amazed when people go to their first Olympics and perform. When I see it, I'm like, "It's a big flex. That's yeah. impressive." It is. Uh, so my first Olympics uh, was 19, just turning 19, and it was um, I overtrained. I probably partied too much. I was, you know, I I was. I played, I played too much. So I worked too hard, played too hard, then got to the Olympics and I was just bug eyed. I went to the Olympics and it was like, I'm at Disneyland for Olympians and everybody's an Olympian and I'm an Olympian. I was looking at everybody with big eyes and I, I just, I, I completely drained all my energy. By the time I went to the, to this one event that I had 200 fly, I swam, I, excuse me, I got into the ready room. And I, I swear to you, there was, there was one of the swimmers was in the corner and he was sniffling. I thought he was crying. I'm pretty sure he was like losing it. And uh, Mikhail Gross was the, the, the star of the time and he oh wasn't there yet and he showed up late and I didn't know you could show up late. I showed up like right on time and he showed up right before you're supposed to walk out and he didn't look at anybody. He like looked through me and it flipped me out. So I walked out, didn't feel the ground below my feet. I was so scared. And uh, if I'd got my best time, I would have gotten second, got a silver medal. I got a fifth. Mm. And I, I can't That's like I can't express to you the feeling, the, the heaviness of hanging onto the wall after getting fifth place and going a time that I'd gone three years before. Yeah. It was just devastating. Yeah. Same thing happened to me in my first Olympics in Atlanta. I got fifth place. My best time would have gotten me the silver. And it, you're just sitting there on the wall, like thinking, just let a big one pass. A big opportunity just passed. And did, did you, did you, do you feel like you were looking back now as, as, a, as a grown man and a father? And, uh, do you think that you were depressed for a period of time after that, or did you rebound? No, I, I had to, I had to lead off the four by 200 the next day and I got fired up and I did a lifetime best leading off 24 hours later. So I recovered pretty quick. I used that anger, frustration, you know, t- channeled it well the next day, the next night. So it all worked out. I, 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 you know, if I'd had an opportunity, if I'd had the talent and range that you had, and I could have, I could have gone out there and done something else. I, I might've recovered. Wow. But it felt like a death. It felt like a death blow to me at the time. Yeah. Well, you did recover well because by '91, um, beautiful race. You get the world record. You progress through the '90, '89, '90, '91. Um, any anything significant in those interim years uh, that really helped you progress? Obviously, you're at Tennessee. You're doing your thing for USA team in the summers. College team during the school year. You're working your way towards 92, the gold medal moment. 
um, but you break the world record in 91. I had a quick question though. What's your favorite video or your favorite moment, the world record or the gold medal? I watch the world record. If I, if I watch anything from the past, I watch the world record performance because it was very, um, there was a lot type to me, the world record performance or world championships beating Mikhail Gross was, was the Olympic gold medal. Cause I, I won in 92 in in January of 1991. And I'll, and I'll explain that. So let's just say, <clears throat> we go back to 88 and some, some historic nodes, uh, depressed, uh, had to build confidence back, was playing it too safe when I ran. Um, so for a couple of years, it was super safe. Like I did, I didn't feel pain in my races. So I would win. I was going some solid times. I don't think that necessarily my event was very competitive for about 24 months. So no. I benefited from nothing really happened. Nobody broke world records. There weren't any American records, but I was still able to win. Yeah. And it was, just, it was just sort of a weak period in history. But so I benefited from that, but I didn't feel pain. I didn't get after it. Uh, I, I was sort of getting blessed. So I was winning. I was winning national championships and, yeah. and being ranked number one in the world. But it was, it was becoming bland. My father, uh, you know, he's my dad. He's big Melvin. And he, he knew something was wrong with me. So he sought out this guy, David Marsh, who coached at Las Vegas Gold. And uh, he goes, Melvin Jr., I think that uh, you need to go swim with this guy, David Marsh. He's a good guy. I spent some time with him. I went out to Vegas, saw him for a weekend. I like him. I like what he's about. It must, might be a fresh perspective. So I went and and I trust him. I love him. Trust my father. So I went to Las Vegas Gold. He was an age group coach at the time in his early 30s. And uh, he, he only for a few years had he taken over the head coaching position from Rowdy Gaines, who had been the head coach there. Wow. I get there and the first day I'm there, he looks at me in the morning practice and he looks and he's just like, he's very charming when he talked on the phone and it was, it sounded like it was going to be this great experience. And I get there and he's kind of, kind of, kind of nasty to me and real gruff. And he just, he just looks at me and he says, I'm going to change your stroke in three places. And I'm not going to tell you what I said to him because I was number one in the world. Right. But, but I, but I said I was number one in the world and I basically Said I dropped some f bombs and and spoke my mind. I was whatever. When I changed my stroke in three places, um, what he did, he, he I, had, I was entering my hands close together out front. Oh yeah. that's what Mikhail Gross did, world champion. Right. And uh, he got me to move my hands to shoulder width apart. Yep. And so he so he did that. So I was turning over faster. I wasn't I wasn't having a moment where I was losing inertia going forward. I was a consistent speed going forward. It flattened me out a little bit, second change. And, uh, and he was pushing me to um, get into my catch quickly and, and even out my, the, the emphasis of my two kicks in my, in my fly stroke cycle. So yeah. what he did was he basically took my, he was working entirely with energy systems and keeping the fly at a consistent pace. So I went from taking like 16 strokes per lap to taking 17 to 19, 17 on the first lap, 17, 18, 19. And uh, I broke the American record that summer, like within mm -hmm. seven weeks. It was Pablo Morales' American record. Wow. And I, he, tra he, he transformed he transformed my fly. That's I wouldn't have broken an American. I don't think I'd have broken an American. I might have, I might have eked out an American record, but I never would really have gotten near a world record. So wow. David Marsh before Auburn. That was, I'm, I'm the first, I was his first baby, the magic man, Marsh. I was the first guinea pig that, uh, they hit that elite. And, and then he did that over and over again. And we, you could go through a long list of athletes, Olympic oh, yeah. champions, swim stars that he, he did that for. Um, so I was scared of Mikhail Gross and I had to face him, uh, seven, seven, six, seven months later, seven months later at world championships after breaking the American record the summer of, uh, with David Marsh. Oh. And I said, I'd, I'd set a goal time down two years before of going 155, 80 in the 200 fly. And I put it on my bathroom mirror and it was in school in the dorm room. And, um, I came there one day and it was gone and I couldn't figure it out. We had maid service at the university of Tennessee 
not a king size bed, a suite, maid service. There were different times. <laughs> not, an awesome. not an institute, not an institute violation. <laughs> but, uh, and we had steak, shrimp, lobster, and crab legs. Uh, it was not the same as the other, the other students on campus. No. So I figured that the maid had removed it because there was something inside of my medicine cabinet. I went down to the swimming pool, walked in, and with my teammates, who I love, yelled out, it's Melvin Stewart, the next world champion and world record holder, beating Mikhail Gross in a 155.80. So they made fun of me. Everybody yeah. laughed. And uh, I worked a lot harder. You know, I was mad. I worked a lot harder. It, just, it, it didn't seem conceivable to them that that could be done. And, you know, I didn't believe it either. I didn't. I was very insecure and very and hurt from the experience in 1988 and afraid of Mikhail Gross. But I, I spent so much time thinking and my daily ritual was I'd wake up in the morning and I would th and I, my feet would hit the floor and I would say, today is another day. I'm going to take a step toward being the swimmer that I want to be. I walked on a medicine cabinet. I'd open the medicine cabinet and I would read, today is the day I take another step towards swimming 155.80 in the 200 meter butterfly and beating Michael Gross and retiring him. My goal was to retire him. I did that every day. I would go into practice. Um, I wouldn't walk. I would run. Because I'm like, this is from that, from the moment I left my dorm room to the time that I hit the, the pool deck, to me, that was practice. So I was practicing earlier. Yeah. And that, so it was very monk like in my discipline. So went to world championships, didn't look at Mikhail Gross in the waiting room, swam the race, chased him for three fifties, passed him in the last fifty, and went one fifty five six nine. Eleven one hundreds off my goal time. Within ten minutes in the press conference, Gross retires. He says, I can't go under one fifty six. I will I can't I can't come home in a twenty nine on the last fifty. And uh, I went, I flew home 30 hours from like, I was Perth, Australia, Sydney, Los Angeles, Atlanta, Knoxville, Tennessee. I get off the plane. My behind is flat. I feel terrible. My entire team is there. They shake my hand and they're like, congratulations. A lot of apologies for the moment. <laughs> and uh, that's my, and, and, I, and I won in that moment. When Gross retired, I had sealed, you know, with that. That was really the moment when 92 was won. I love that story. I just watched your video before our interview, and that it's so well paid. The last 50 is so good, and uh, it's a beautiful time. Still a great time today, some 30 years later. And uh, it's just uh, obviously the work that it took to come back like that was a lot. And so just well, I have a lot of respect for you. Um, for the work that it took. And uh, so that, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. And so obviously 92, you could just kind of keep keep on keeping on and you win the gold. Um, any any special moments uh, about about Barcelona? Everybody says it's a wonderful city. It was a wonderful games. Uh, again, USA wasn't completely dominant like like we've been blessed with the last six or seven Olympics, but but it was a good Olympics. And there was some, some some good good highlights. Yours was one of them. But give us some background we, we, for nineteen. Context context of nineteen ninety two was uh, so I won I, I won two goals and a bronze, and we like we got bronze in the four by two relay. So if you're looking at it context of history now, where we didn't podium in the four by two at this Olympics, when we got bronze in ninety two in the two hundred free, it was like it was shameful. It was like, I got to be honest with you. I haven't seen that medal since 92. It's in a box somewhere. I haven't seen it. But it was like there was, because we the, the expectation was that we would win. We got behind. The pool started rocking. I split a 148. Went third, split 148, which was fast. That was good back then. I think it might have been the fastest split <laughs> on the relay. And it was, uh, but we didn't do it. But the, there were the, we didn't have a Spitz. We didn't have a Biondi. We didn't have somebody, you know, gunning for seven gold medals, much less eight gold medals. Um, so the, the big star of our 92 Olympics was the dream team, the basketball team, the first time pro basketball players, and they dominated the news. 
But among the swimming ranks, Summer Sanders was the star, I think, of 92. She won four medals, probably should have won three gold. But she, uh, you know, there's some controversy over the Chinese swimmers that she was racing against and whether or not they were above board. But she, she had a great Olympics. I think she was a star of that Olympics. And uh, the collectively, what I remember about that Olympics was that, you know, it, it, it wasn't until her last race that she won gold in 200 fly. And it was like the sense of relief from everybody on the team was just, oh, thank God. So, yeah, because everybody loved her. She's one of those swimmers that everybody just loved. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that was 92. And I didn't retire after 92. I, uh, 94, I go to world champs in Rome, and the Chinese were much larger, much bigger, won everything, a lot of world records. And so that was crazy. Turns out they were cheating. And then 95, I think you and I were on a team together, the USA dual meet versus uh, some college teams at, was it at Michigan or Tennessee? I can't remember now. I can't remember. But, but I remember. Or that was our only, I think, one of our only teams together. It was just that weekend, the USA versus some college teams. And uh, But then 96, I'm finally coming along, and you're trying out one more time. So what was, what was uh, Indy Trials 96? To me, you're still, you still were in great shape, had lots of opening speed, but, but it seemed like you weren't able to do the turn or fly work that you had done previously. The um, so I think emotionally I was over swimming, and mm -hmm. by the time I really got back into it and got aggressive, um, you know, I was looking around and there was nobody there, nobody had improved, and I didn't think anything of it. And mm -hmm. on purpose, I was like, uh, my the person I have to beat is Dennis Pankratov, the Russian, and um, trials I'm just going to swim through trials, and I normally did a six week taper. I was pretty stout like you know six one you know 195 pounds and i had i was always had a long taper because i did a lot of work yeah and i didn't do a full taper and it was just you know you cannot have an ego when it comes to u.s trials you can't do it you've got to you've got to be you got to be more self-aware than that yeah. and um in 200 fly when you don't fully rest the way you feel it the most on the back end yeah. So it's like, I, I think about this. I think, I think Ryan Lochte at the 2021, 2000, you know, the U S recent trials, I think he probably was too tired. People are like, he's dying. He's not fit. I'm like, no, I think he's fit. I just think he needs more rest. No, With more point. rest, you finish your races. So my 200 fly didn't have finishing speed because I was still broken down and deservedly. I got my butt handed to me. I got third place. I missed making the team by a fingernail. And was like, I remember like Tom Malchow won, and I remember sitting in the in the in the pool and thinking to myself, doing the calculations, going, I screwed that up, that was dumb. Do I want to do this until two thousand? And I like I was doing that calculation in my head. So do I really want to work this hard until two thousand? Because this was a really big mistake. And you know the truth is, it was too hard. I was like, this yeah. is too hard. I don't want to feel that much pain anymore. And I remember walking out of the pool, walking over the diving well, doing the post-race interview and saying, that's it for me. I'm done. <laughs> I'm out. I'm out. Uh, but, but, but I have to say this. I really, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an old man now, you know, I'm heading up swim, swim, swim .com with my co-founders and love it. And when I look back at my experience, I'm so thankful that I went to an Olympics and had a bad Olympics, that I went to an Olympics and had a great Olympics. Yeah. And then I went to my third Olympic trials and I became a member of the third place club. <laughs> I have the full experience of swim as an elite. Yeah. I got it all. That's good. I am. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about the Hollywood years. You kind of did an Anthony Irvin where you kind of went to the beach in LA and we didn't really hear from you for a while. We're like, where is he? What's he doing? And you were kind of, I wouldn't say above us, but you were working on other projects 
um, and you were rolling with some 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 elites and some Hollywood types, and uh, the, the, someone bought your movie script, and you met a lot of neat people. You did a lot of interesting things. Probably learned a lot about that kind of impacted what you're doing now in the world of entertainment and marketing and media. And uh, I don't know, how, can you summarize the Hollywood years for us? I'll, I'll summarize it this way. The, uh, so I, I, I was, I was close to having a minor in theater at the university of Tennessee and just fell backwards into it and loved it. Thought it was fun. I think everybody should, should, should get a minor in theater, whether you're going to be an attorney or in business or whatever. It's just, it, for, it, it feels like swimming because once it starts, you can't stop. Once the, the gun goes off, action, you're, you know, you're moving and you have to, <clears throat> you're course correcting all the time. And I like that. It, it feels like a sport to me. Um, so anyway, I, 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 but I really enjoyed creation of story. And that's where my passion was. And the, so I've been writing all the time. And I had, I had, I actually had a big body of work by the time I, sh you know, I showed up in Los Angeles, but I got very lucky. Um, I partnered with somebody who was, uh, who had met, who was, who'd started as, out as a journalist and then became a screenwriter and had success as a screenwriter. And we went out with my story and went out on a Friday, went out on a Monday. And by Friday, every single studio except Warner Brothers and Warner Brothers did bid on it. Someone didn't bid on it. One of the studios, of all the studios, one didn't bid. But they all bid on it. And I was almost a millionaire in five days. <laughs> what? I rented a place, got a fat sports car, I, and I was convinced I was going to be Steven Spielberg. And there, so we wrote on that movie. In Hollywood, you write and write and write and write until the producers are happy. And, uh, and I didn't, I was green. I didn't know. I didn't know that like the average movie took seven years to make. And, uh, I didn't know a lot of things, yeah. but, um, that project was bought twice. They bought, they bought my project twice and then released the rights back to me. It was, it was 20th century Fox. It was Fox 2000, which was their, their, their highbrow serious division, but it was bought to be a, an Academy award winning movie. It's a very, it's a crazy movie. My life story is pretty crazy. Not, might not be right for kids on a podcast, but the uh, so anyway, I wrote after that for many years. I wrote a lot of movies for the Sci Fi Channel. Uh, my buddy's first directorial debut was on the Sci Fi Channel, and I was in the movie. Um, I I got the project uh, Phantom, which is a comic, the first comic book that's ever written, and I wrote that for many years. Didn't get made, but it was uh, it's considered a very impressive script. Um, the movie had been made in 1997 with Billy Zane. It was very poor at the box office. They brought it back to me and they, I didn't even have to really try to get it. I'd gotten it based on past work from some very powerful people. They're like, give it to Mel. Cool. Um, so I, I did a lot of different things. I acted in, I was in a movie with Harvey Keitel. I was in Dolph Lundgren movie. I, I was in several episodes of Baywatch. But, but I never auditioned for anything. It was always, I was, did it as a writer. I was in the room because I was a writer. So my experience was sort of like training for the Olympics and never going to the Olympics. And it was, it was very much like swimming. It's very disciplined. Yeah. And, um, and I was very unhappy. And my wife knew I was unhappy and she's like, you should, you know, you need to do something that makes you happy. And I went to Chuck Wilgus, who is the CEO of USA Swimming, and convinced him that he needed to have production and uh, messaging for USA Swimming. And, uh, and he gave me a job. He gave me a contract. Yeah. And he did. And then I called up my director buddies and said, what do I do? <laughs> I don't know what to do. I don't really have the skill set for this. What do I really need to do? Yeah. And learned everything that I learned on the fly. With, and I learned it, you know, I learned it in the USA Swimming culture. And they gave me, you know, thankfully, thank God for them, they gave me enough. So I came back home to family and family op opened their arms up and embraced me. That culture worked for me. And they were very, uh, it was a very supportive space. But also it was sort of like being successful there after being in Hollywood. It was, Hollywood's hard. Oh, yeah. Hollywood's 
Hollywood's cutthroat. This was a this is a much healthier environment, and it was it, it was one of the best moves I've ever made. But interesting thing is, my friends like they went on and won Academy Awards. Um, one of my closest buddies is, is a sweetheart. He's one of the he's a co executive producer of Black Summer on Netflix, and uh, he calls me up and I'm like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "He's he's got a good life. <laughs> they have good lives." <laughs> But, but all but that experience has all been poured into some swam. Right. Yeah. Well, I remember when you came, we met at Golden Goggles in 2006. You were kind of coming back around and it was so good to see you. And you were kind of, I was, I think I was interviewing and taking some videos. And I just remember you thinking like, well, geez, I can, I can do that. And so then you kind of ran with it. But, uh, but I love when we get to partner on USA Swimming Foundation things. I love when we get to connect with old alumni. You do such a good job of welcoming everybody and partnering with them. Um, so that's one of the joys of my life is getting to reconnect with you and the gang. And uh, so I appreciate you doing that. And then in 2012, March of 2012, we actually had launched our websites at the same time. Mine was Ultimate Swimmer and yours was Swim Swam. And uh, I, got, I wasn't able to launch mine quite as well because I was on the road so much. Uh, but you had it, had it nailed and you had good partners and um, it has is, is been incredible what y'all accomplished the last nine years and the content you've made and everybody goes there to get their news and to, to know what's going on. And uh, so I just want to thank you for, for doing a great job these last nine years on making a great uh, website and a great product. I'll, I'll say this. The, uh, I think as swimmers, culturally, we all work. We know how to work hard. Yeah. Swimmers know how to work. They know how to be disciplined. They, they show up. They show up on time. They get the job done. Uh, it's, it's helpful to be lucky. It's helpful to have good timing. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the hard part about life is that you're going to show up and you're going to work your butt off. And it's not always going to work out for you. But you got to keep doing it over and over and over until the timing's right. That's right. Uh, you know, and, and, and I, we got lucky. There are a lot of we, there are a lot of lucky moments for swim swam. A lot of a lot of timing things that worked out for us, with technology, with the right team members in place. Mm -hmm. So I wish I could take all that success and just take it personally, but uh, I can't. There's a lot of luck, and a lot a lot of other people who are smarter than I am who are involved. Oh yeah. And my favorite moment of ours is 2008 Beijing. We're both in the stands helping che lead cheers with the alumni and the 400 free relay walks out and I stand up because I knew something special was going to happen. Or I just stand up anyway, because you know me, I get commentating and getting excited and all the Chinese workers, um, the volunteers, they say, please sit down, please sit down. And I'm like, I'm not sitting down. I cannot sit down for this. And all the other people around us are still sitting down. I'm the only one standing up. And then I don't know what other boring countries they were from, but there's no way I'm sitting down. And then sure enough, Michael leads off and then you stand up and then everybody else around us stands up finally. And then Garrett jumps in and then Cullen jumps in and then Lee Zach does the thing, the miracle swim, the legendary anchor. And we're like literally climbing on each other yelling at the top of our lungs and you're trying to videotape it at the same time <laughs> and we are going nuts and i'm so glad i got to share that with you and i'm so glad i got to see it with my own two eyes and share it with you and an alumni uh, anyway i just love that moment well i i've got to share this one piece of information about that moment so i was working with I bought a phone. It was the most expensive phone in the world that you could buy. It was a Nokia phone and the most expensive phone that you could buy to date in the world for video. And I got to where I got so good at, at, at capturing video with this phone. I could just pop it open, hit the button, boom. I could hold, I could move it like a steady cam. It was a really great little piece of technology well in advance of, of, of the time. Yeah. And I, so I captured this moment and the video is really you. The video is, is everyone around you because we're surrounded by Olympic peers. We're surrounded by VIPs. And everything just sort of falls away. And, and, but it was really you going nuts in the volume of your voice. And it was a deafening all around us. So I captured us just cheering. I put it up on a YouTube channel, a personal YouTube channel. And it was getting like 100,000 views every 30 minutes because it was so electric. 
It's just us cheering. A bunch of Olympians cheering for the four by one relay where Jason Lezak saves the day in the greatest Olympic race of all time. Yeah. I got a phone call from a uh, legal department at NBC saying, you can't shoot video inside that arena. And they took it down eventually. But it almost had a million views in a few short hours. And back then, that was a big, big deal. It was a very big deal. That didn't happen. Now. now people can just put whatever they want on the internet. Yeah. Well, anyway, we we can we can have it in our memory. But um, what is what is the future for uh, for Swim Swam and for Mel Stewart? I think that the future is that you know it, we we managed to live through a pandemic like everybody else, and it's uh, I can't imagine being an athlete right now and having to to manage. Uh, this in your career, it's it's astounding to me. If you if if, if I told you, Jay, you know, Josh, that I was gonna have to, I was gonna throw a pandemic in your path before, before you know, the, forget the Olympics, NC two A's, World yeah. Champs, anything. It just seems like it's so difficult. Junior nationals, it's too much. And uh, so I think we're you know we're exhausted and tired after living through that period of time. And uh, but we worked hard. You know, the beauty is that it happened and the beauty is that it didn't kill us. The beauty is that it gave us time to go, how resilient are we? And I felt, I learned that we are very resilient and that all the work, hard work from previous years had paid off. And I learned that we're, I'm seeing after coming out of Olympics that we're going to be much stronger. So I'm very excited about the Paris Olympics. I'm very excited about a short three years. Yeah. And I think it's going to go fast. And I think that that 2000, by the time we roll into 2028 Los Angeles Olympics, I think that swimming is going to have a new renaissance. I think it's, I think this is going to top 1984 when the Olympics were in Los Angeles yeah. then. And uh, I think it's going to be a special moment. We're going to be a little grayer when we get there, but I guarantee I'm going to be there with you. Be lots of hugs. We're going to be very happy about where we're at. I love that. That gave me chills just thinking about 28, us hosting the games again. And uh, hopefully we get to have more moments together hugging on each other. So, well, thank you for sharing your life. Thank you for making swimming more fun and making the swimming world better. And uh, I can't wait to see you around the pool again soon. I love you, man. I love you too, buddy. Thank you for joining us on this Ultimate Swimmer podcast. We hope you enjoyed hearing from these Olympians and life champions and how certain habits and decisions help them on their journey, and they can help you too. If there is an Ultimate Swimmer from your team that you would like to nominate that we can recognize on our show, just email me at josh at joshdavis.com. That's josh at joshdavis.com. And tell us about how your Ultimate Swimmer is making a difference in your swimming community. And that's the goal to make a difference and swim with purpose. Not only are you getting better, but you're helping those around you get better too. When you realize you were born for the water, born for greatness, and born to serve others, you are on your way to becoming an ultimate swimmer. I'm Josh Davis. Until next time, keep streamlining and keep smiling. See you around the pool soon.